Um, so I currently work as a researcher at somewhere called the Center for Spatial Research at Columbia University. Um, we're housed within the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation within Columbia. Um, and I'll say that my work and training is grounded in the context of data-driven urban planning and policy with a focus on the ethics and politics of data visualization. Um, and much of my work, both at the Center for Spatial Research and before, uh, explores the interplay between information landscapes and urban landscapes. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about a, a project that I worked on a couple of years ago um, that I think speaks to many of the core challenges embedded in data-driven decision-making in urban environments, um, that speaks to many of the challenging ethical issues often hidden behind data-driven urban and public policy. Um, and that I also think is a powerful illustration and reminder about the kind of abstraction that goes into making any and all data. Um, and I'll say that these kinds of considerations have a real urgency right now within the fields of urban planning um, and design. Um, when it seems like every day there's a new proposal for how the city could be understood, governed, optimized, insert your word here, by algorithms with no democratic processes needed. Um, and so one of the things that I think is under-discussed in a lot of these debates is the inputs, the underlying data that's going into how we're make, supposedly making these decisions. Um, and in light of this, I'm interested today um, about the ways that sources of data often invisibly and sometimes perniciously shape public policy through the methods behind their collection. So I, in this project, um, I recently explored how data was used and created by state and corporate entities in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. I'll explain what this is in a minute. Um, and I focused especially on the role that imperfect data sets played in the disbursement of federal aid in response to the foreclosure crisis. I, through this project, I surveyed the patchwork of available sources of key information um, in order to look at what the foreclosure crisis reveals for how we've begun to use data to depict, manage, and intervene in urban environments. The project's medium was maps, 165 of them, um, curated into an exhibit. Um, through these maps, I created a time-lapse cartographic portrait, oops, sorry, um, of the rate of residential vacancy across the U.S., um, and also in four case study cities. Spanning the period from 2005 through 2013, um, the data set that I analyzed in order to make these maps is something called the U.S. Postal Service Vacancy Survey. Um, and I learned about this obscure data set because it was one of the inputs that was used in determining how federal funds would be allocated ge geographically under the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010 specifically under a U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development program called the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. So in 2010, when Dodd-Frank was passed by Congress and signed into law, this is some great applause for when that, that <laughs> act <laughs> was signed. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Getty Images. Uh, so in addition to passing some, though I'll say not nearly enough, reforms for Wall Street to sort of mitigate the kinds of um, financial and data dealings that got us into this mess, uh, $1 billion was earmarked um, and made available to communities in order, through the De U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development um, in order to target communities that were most um, severely impacted by the foreclosure crisis. It was designed to be earmarked um, for these communities witnessing the worst impacts. So HUD determined how to directly target these funds to communities of greatest need through a formula. Um, it was distributed across towns and cities and counties according to this formula, which used several different data sets as inputs. Um, this is their documentation, just a screenshot actually, that was made available when the, when the funding was made available. Um, and it relies primarily on delinquency and foreclosure filings from the Mortgage Bankers Association um, National Delinquency Survey, as well as data from an agency called McDash Analytics, which they used to train a model, um, which was then comprised of publicly available data sets that would predict serious delinquency rates at the census tract level across the US. 
And then on top of this, because the goal in this third round of neighborhood stabilization program funding, which was coming in 2010, so when vacancy was really becoming one of the core impacts of the foreclosure crisis, no, it wasn't just that people were being going delinquent on their loans and leaving their homes, but now communities were really seeing the impact of this massive urban crisis with abandonment. Um, so because the goal of this trough of funding um, was to target these neighborhood effects of vacancy, they also added an additional data set, the US Postal Service Vacancy Survey. So the funding was distributed first at a statewide level and then more locally to target local geographies. And then they came out with dollar amounts that went to specific municipalities across the US. So one of the things that I found really striking when I was digging into researching the inputs that went into this methodology that HUD was using is that most of the data sources that went into it or that informed their models were ones held by for-profit companies. Indeed, many for-profit companies who were themselves profiting off of the foreclosure crisis that this policy is meant to, to, to impact. You know, you, you can't make this stuff up. Um, so I was interested in investigating these underlying inputs, as I mentioned, to know more about how and what they represented of the United States. Um, and my goal with the project was not at all to dismantle the funding allocation methodology by HUD. Um, plus, by this point in 2010, knowing which communities were most hard hit by the foreclosure crisis was something that was fairly well known and not, on, not only on the basis of when the peak number of mortgage delinquency filings were made. Um, so as the core public non-proprietary data source, I set out to learn more about this US Postal Service Vacancy Survey. This is a screenshot of some, though not all, of, of the columns in said data set. Um, so as it turns out, the US Postal Service Vacancy Survey um, is created by postal workers when they are going on their daily routes delivering mail across the US. At each home or business on their route, postal workers, in addition to dropping off mail, note whether the occupants of that address have been picking up their mail. Um, and the residences that are left empty for 90 days or longer are the ones that are represented in this data set, which you see flickering across the screen right now. Um, so the responses are recorded and then they're aggregated into quarterly snapshots, which are shared to the US Department of Housing and Urban Development at the census tract level every um, three months, as I said. And I'd like to pause to just convey how remarkable I think this is. Um, that every day, postal workers visit every address across the US and they look at the address and they write down whether there are people there. That's amazing. <laughs> um, and I was really drawn to this deeply poetic, in my mind, connection between the everyday, these visits of postal workers to addresses across the US, and the abstract numbers of vacant housing units per census tract for the entire US. Um, so that really, you know, the, that basically the, the census takes 10 years to orchestrate. Doing a survey of all of the residences across the US is such a massive undertaking that it takes this much planning to go into. Nevertheless, postal workers are having encounters at front doors and post office boxes every single day, except for Sundays. <laughs> um, so why does this data set exist? The first step in my mind in doing ethical work with data is understanding where it comes from. Why was it collected? What went into its collection um, that may or may not impact the actual information about the real world that it records? Um, and so in this case, the US Postal Service Vacancy Survey is collected um, in order to sell it to advertisers. It's the origins of junk mail. Um, the US Postal Service has a vested interest in knowing which are active addresses because they can sell it to the advertisers who are willing to pay for this information to send you unwanted pieces of paper. Um, so the fact that the US Department of Housing and Urban Development can use this data set as a, a much more fine-grained measure of household vacancies across the US um, than you would get through the American Community Survey or the Census, et cetera, is a completely accidental, a really unintended byproduct of um, its original reason for being collected. Um, but even as this accidental byproduct, 
um, it's a very powerful data set. I was through using it, I was able to dynamically visualize the ways and places um, where the foreclosure crisis had erupted into a vacancy crisis. While foreclosure is always a crisis for individual households, vacancy is really the way that the for foreclosure becomes a collective crisis for communities, an agent for collective urban transformation. Um, so behind each of these flickering census tracts are stories of loss and community transformation. Um, powerful ones that, that deserve further inquiry. Um, and so through the project, I made some interesting findings about the, the data set itself. For example, Phoenix, Arizona, one of the cities I focused on, reached its peak um, vacancy rate in the, for the period that I looked at in June 2010, um, where 6.72% of all homes in Phoenix, Arizona were marked as vacant for 90 days or longer um, in the data set. Miami-Dade County, Florida, and New York City both reached their peaks by September um, of 2010 as well, whereas Detroit, Michigan shows an altogether different pattern with vacancy rates continuing to rise through 2013. Um, it's worth noting that HUD in their funding allocation formula uses the number of vacant homes as of June 2008, which is well before the number of vacant homes peaks for, for the U.S. as a whole or any of the cities that I looked at. Um, and I also discovered that there are major inconsistencies in the method of collecting this data for this period, as one would expect of a data set collected by thousands and thousands of individuals for the purpose of distributing junk mail, um, and led to large spikes in the overall number of residential addresses. Um, and so the other thing that I was really especially drawn to here is how the data set um, really reveals the logic of abstraction that's at work in all data. Um, the national vacancy rate fully masks and is yet dependent on the individual routines of postal workers as they visit addresses across the US. So these postal workers' daily walks are hidden behind the CSV, or actually it was a DBF table. Um, that this is, is hidden, these individual stories are hidden within this data set. Um, and so the project combines data visualization, critical cartography, and uses both to explore tensions between the cartographic, um, statistical, and ordinary ways of understanding the built world. Um, and this split between the cartographic and the everyday is a principal interest of mine, something I've returned to on a number of projects, both um, at, my, at my current job at the Center for Spatial Research and before. And the stakes for engaging with these kinds of questions become especially clear in the context of data-driven policy programs like the Neighborhood Stabilization Program, where abstraction, you sort of have this loop from individual encounters with postal workers in the real world, abstraction, which feeds in into policy, which then has real impacts in the real world. Um, and this kind of tension is something that the geographer Trevor Paglin um, writes on in the context of, cart of cartography. Um, I won't read this whole quote because you all can, um, but where he talks about the God's eye view of cartographic analysis is often not helpful for depicting relationships that he's really interested in, relationships about the everyday, because of the forms of power that are embedded in this cartographic view um, that often obscure notions of fragmentedness and incompleteness that on the ground viewpoints um, do a better job of em embracing. And so while I completely agree with his insights and I'm a big fan of his work, um, I would argue, and I think this project argues, that fragmentedness and incompleteness are not at all characteristics that are reserved for on the ground everyday viewpoints, but instead what's particularly insidious about the God's eye view or the God's eye mode of big data analysis is its claims to see or reveal an unfragmented and complete world. That the claims that the US Postal Service data set is a picture of all residential vacancies in the US. And so by highlighting the relationship between the data set and its mode of collection, I think there's an opportunity to reveal precisely how fragmented this supposedly complete picture often is. Um, in her recent book, Kathy O'Neill, speaks to the disastrous consequences of fragmentedness, but in the context of algorithmic decision making. Um, and where for her, the God's eye view of cartography is instead the ever powerful algorithm. 
Um, and she speaks about the ways that biased and skewed and incomplete data sets are often one of the key ways that algorithms lead to unethical modes of decision making. Um, the data is an abstraction. That's how it's useful, but that's also how it's dangerous. Um, and I'll sort of wrap up, wrap up here, but so she urges users of data and makers of models to think about the data that goes into them and also to understand all of these inputs as moral questions. Um, so I'll end, end with her, her quote here um, to say that I completely agree with her concerns, that they, we need to do a better job of knitting together connections between technical models and the everyday people they're seeking to describe and change the lives of. Um, and one of the things that I found powerful about the vacancy survey is the way that it really does this, that it, it captures the routines of these people as they go through every address in the US um, and is a powerful reminder that all of our work um, to, to transform the world through data really needs to keep this in mind. Um, so that data-driven processes can be powerful ones, but ones that are also deeply democratic. Thank you. Uh, I think there are time for a few questions, if people have them. Yeah. Uh, I always get these two states confused, but looking right now at the map, it seems like Alabama. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's a giant black hole pretty hard on the state border. What's up with that? Uh, that's something that would it would be good to dig further into. My guess would be that um, those are that sort of area of northern Alabama in particular is fairly rural. There's an issue in the data set that I didn't speak about, um, which is also they have a category called no stat addresses um, that puts a lot of fuzziness around it as a measure of vacancy in rural zones. It's a much more accurate measure in cities. Um, so that could be one p potential cause. Um, maybe there's less of a directive in Alabama for postal workers to record this information than their, than their neighbors in Georgia and, and elsewhere. Yeah, so all good eyes and interesting questions. Yes? Uh, you mentioned uh, data consistencies, data inconsistencies over time and how data is collected. Yeah. Um, yeah, so basically I uncovered those through a combination of looking, so the data is released in quarterly snapshots, so it was a big undertaking to com combine all of those massive DBF tables. Um, and uh, so I looked at it as a time series as opposed to just looking at individual snapshots, which is how HUD used it in their methodology. So to be fair, the fact that it changed over time is not a concern for them because they weren't actually doing an average over time, et cetera, but still it, it speaks to me um, about the inconsistency of it as a, as a solid measure. Um, and so just there were literally spikes in the number, the total number of addresses that existed in the US by the tens of thousands from like one three month period to the next. Yeah, craziness. Yes. Is this the methodology for the survey collection documented at all? Like, or is it seriously like when the postal worker feels like something's been <laughs> absent for 90 days? Like are they writing, literally writing down like Tuesday, these three addresses didn't pick up their mail. Wednesday, they did. Like, yeah. How, how detailed is the status on the um, well, so underneath, like one of the things that I'll say is good about the way that the data set is released. You wouldn't really want to have a, you know, day by day picture of an, every single home in the U.S. That's really terrifying, actually. <laughs> um, so HUD gets the data and makes it available to nonprofits. I work at a university and, and was able to get through it that way. And so it's aggregated. Um, so that covers a lot of it. So in terms of the methodology of how the postal workers, you know, what they're supposed to do, what the interface is for how they're entering this information, no idea. Um, I, and and the, the methodology is that they report is that we collect this information for our own purposes and then also make it available. So they sort of wring their hands of responsibility that way. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know if the postal workers put any other information on That's a very good question. Yeah, I know. It feels like there would be a lot, a lot that they could do there. I don't know, frankly. This is the only, like when I was doing research into you know, why this existed and all that, this is the only data set that I came across that they collect, or certainly that's made available that they collect. Yeah. Awesome. I know I'm up against time. Well, thank you all so much.